Welcome everyone to our A to J Author new user webinar for April. This is Jessica Frank. I'm A to J Author's project manager. Today we're going to talk about scripting logic statements in A to J Author. Logic statements can also be called advanced conditions, so I may use those phrases interchangeably today. I like to try to give some quick authoring tips for issues that have arisen over the past month. This month, it's just a reminder to update your feedback email in the About tab under the Send Feedback field. It's best if you use a generic email account like, or that multiple people in your organization can access, like feedback at xlegalaid.org. That way, when you move on, say you win the lotto or you leave your organization, those feedback emails aren't orphaned in your old own personal email account. So I've seen this multiple times because we also on the A to J author team get a copy of the feedback when a user sends it in. Um, so I see where I know that the author has left the organization and the organization isn't getting the email or the feedback from the end users. And I forward them on when I can, when I know who the new author is or who's in charge of the program. But sometimes the forms have been orphaned. Um, and so that leaves a form out there and feedback coming in from users and nobody knowing about, about that in the organization that created the original interview. So you want to make sure that that feedback continues once you, the personal author, have moved on. And when you do make the update in your A to J guide interview by changing the email under the send feedback button, um, make sure that you republish your interview then to a to j.org or LHI or wherever you self-host your interview to capture those updates. So let's now uh, move on and talk about scripting logic. So all logic statements are written in the advanced logic section of the question design editor within the author side of your A to J guided interview. You create the logic statements within individual pages. The advanced logic section is at the bottom of the question design editor as seen in this screen grab. There are three components to the advanced logic section, the before, the after, and the citation. In the before and the after field, you can cre create conditional statements that A to J author will use to test the user's data. In the citation field, you can add notes for yourself or future authors that will explain why you drafted your logic statements or why you used a specific condition. For example, why you used $25,000 as a means test in an income uh, limitation. Scripting logic statements can seem intimidating at first if you're not familiar with them, but we've tried to package them up in a way that feels friendly to new users and is also powerful to old hats at the same time. So it is programming, but it's programming light. It's kind of like a Coke Zero. It looks like it, it tastes like it, it works like it, but it's really not programming once you get into it. The important thing to remember is to just treat these logic statements like sentences. So just like a sentence needs a capital letter at the beginning and it needs punctuation at the end, a logic statement needs an if to start and an end if to end. Then there are five commands to remember. If, else, set, go to, and end if. When using variables, you have to put those variables in brackets. When you want to use a go to statement to branch an end user to a specific page, you have to use quotation marks around the name of the page. You also need quotes around any text strings or values that you're evaluating. If you're using a true false variable, it's Boolean, so it doesn't need quotes. And finally, start each of the commands on their own line. So you put a hard return, that's the enter key, in between a line with an if, an else, a set, a go to, or an end if. They cannot be on the same line. So now let's talk about some real life examples that you could employ in your interviews um, moving forward. So the first example I have is writing a condition that will set the correct form of a noun, either the singular or the plural form based on the end user's answer to a question about how many of something they have. So the real world example is that you would use the correct form, is that you would want to use the correct form of the word child or children in a subsequent question. And you also are asking the end user already how many children they have. Perhaps you're about to go into a repeat loop to gather information about those children for your form. So using the variable number child and you, you evaluate whether the number is greater than one using the evaluator symbol greater than. On the next line, you set the variable child or children TE. This is that variable that you're going to use in subsequent pages that's going to hold the correct form of the word child. 
to children in the first line here if the condition of number child and you is greater than one or else otherwise set that same variable to the word child because they only have one child. Behind this question is the assumption that you have asked the end user ahead of time if they had children before you branch them to the question, how many children did they have? Um, if, you have if you didn't ask that question ahead of time, you could script logic that tested if number of child was greater than one and number of uh, number child and you did not equal zero. So there are ways to script in logic to test for those, but it's probably best practices to ask somebody first if they do have children and then ask any follow-up questions only to the people who respond yes, that they have children. The second real world example combines functions and branching in a logic statement. So you can use a logic statement to conditionally branch an end user to a specific question based on some variable value. This routes them outside of the normal branching that occurs via buttons in A to J Author. This example here on the screen asks everyone who uses the form for their birth date. Then there's a condition that tests that user's birth date converted to a year value using the age function to see if the user is over 18. If the value of the variable client DOBDA, their date of birth, converted to a number is less than 18, the end user is routed out of the normal stream of questions to a page that tells them that they aren't old enough to use the automated form and then eventually gracefully kicks them out of the interview or directs them to another set of resources. This sort of logic here is a simple way for authors to save that successful end user, the person who is over 18 and whose birthday you're going to need to know, from answering two questions. They only have to answer their birth date, not are you 18 or older and birth date. So it's saving your end user one step with a simple logic statement. The third example gets more complicated here in that there are it combines multiple conditions into a single logic statement. This screenshot here is showing you two different logic statements. As an aside, you can have as many logic statements on a page as you want. There's no limit um, imposed by the software beyond your imagination and your perseverance in, in dealing with complicated logic. So in this first logic statement, it uses the end user's income in the, it asks for the end user's income in the question and then evaluates whether that is greater than $35,000. So for, for this example, let's assume $35,000 is the income cutoff for your program's eligibility. If the end user makes more than that, then they're automatically disqualified from receiving your organization's services. So in this statement, if the user's income is over $35,000, I want A to J author to set a subsequent variable called income too high TF, a true false variable, to true. And I want to branch the end user to a sorry you don't qualify question, which will then kick them out of the interview. If the user's income is not over $35,000, if this first condition is false, I want that flag variable of income too high TF to be set to false. So I'm not done yet in this scenario evaluating the end user's income. I need to know more about their income if it's in this middle range between $25,000 and $35,000. So for example, from this scenario, people who make $25,000 or less automatically qualify for my program services. However, there's this middle ground of people who make over $25,000 but under the $35,000 cap who might qualify if they meet certain conditions. But I need more information. So the second logic statement here tests for that middle ground. If it finds people between 35,000, less than 35,000, and their income is also greater than 25,000, it's gonna branch them to follow-up questions about their income. So perhaps I'm gonna ask them about expenses they have or any dependents they have. So this means test example on the screen shows you multiple ways that you can include multiple conditions in your logic statement. Another popular one is combining first, middle, and last name into a full name variable. The twist comes on this screenshot in that um, you want to include has answered. The function has answered test for whether a variable holds a value. Here I'm testing whether they, the end user has answered client middle name TE. If they have, I'm gonna set their full name to first name plus a space, that's quote, space, quote um, on the screenshot, plus their middle name plus another quote, space, quote, plus their last name. Else, so if they have not answered middle name, I'm going to just set that full name to first plus space plus last. So this 
make ensures that your final variable doesn't have an odd space, like an extra space where middle name should be, or undefined variable. You don't want someone's name to be um, Jane undefined variable Doe. You want it to just be Jane Doe if Jane hasn't given you a middle name. So this ensures that you don't have any weird spaces or um, unintended unidentified variables on your, uh, your end document. The final example that I have for today came out of helping an author this month. The author's form required the name of the preparer to be included on the form as well as the, um, the litigant's name. So the idea was that their guided interview could be filled out by either the end user completely alone or partially with the assist assistance of an attorney. In the interview, the author asks the end user who they are, either the plaintiff or the defendant, then asks for their name, then combines those with the has answered logic we just talked about into, in this case, plaintiff name full TE. The author then goes through a series of questions asking if an attorney assisted, what that attorney's name is, combining it into um, attorney name full TE. And um, this logic then, there's a question that asks who prepared the template or who prepared the interview. And they have a pick from list field type with the custom options of myself and an attorney. They pick myself. They then, um, the logic will set the prepare name to the plaintiff's name if they are the plaintiff. Um, and then same thing if, if they just say that an attorney is the one who helps prepare the form, then the preparer's name is going to be set to the attorney's name. So that on the, on the completed subsequent template, the author then has the name of the litigants and the name of the attorney, if there is one, and also who prepared it. And it's all structured the way that it needs to be for the court form. So this example builds on that has answered and multiple conditions in one logic block idea. If you all have any questions on any of the real life examples, feel free to put them in the chat or the question box and we can uh, look over those now. And there is, there is a note about um, when I talked in the tips and tricks section about making sure to update uh, your information when, when you update your information in the interview to make sure to upload it and keep that updated on LHI. Uh, Mark Lauritsen pointed out that it also make, make sure whoever owns the account or who has control of the account that that passes on to someone else on your team uh, when you leave the organization as well. You don't want any orphaned interviews sitting in an LHI account either. John, did you have any questions or comments? Oh, tons, but I'll I'll keep it I'll keep it down to one. Okay. It, you know, you, you the, the 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 number of things you can do inside of the logic. Although although you only you know sprinkle little bits of code here and there, um, and I use that word decidedly. Um, it is programming. I mean, these things can get really hairy and gnarly. So. You know, it's it's uh, for for a reasonably complicated uh, guided interview. You know, don't don't kid yourself. You're doing you're doing you're you're a coder of sorts. Um, but but Jessica's right. We're, we we sort of try to make it so it so you don't feel like a coder. Um, and and we're sorry if you want to be a coder. <laughs> um, but we're 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 trying to make this as widely um, accessible as possible uh, so that as many um, you know, simple as well as relatively less simple uh, things can be encoded or can be um, automated for, uh, for anybody's purposes. We do, um, if you are on the, I wish I was more of a coder or I wish there was more in A to J that I could do, um, you can always send me an email with a feature request or something that you, you can't figure out how to do or you wish it would do this that programming did. Um, we've added to the, to the accepted sort of um, lingo in syntax. our, yeah, the syntax in our advanced logic section. So we added like a contains um, function. We've added um, different parameters to be allowed in there. So if there's something that you want to do that you think your interview would benefit from, just let me know um, and we can get that in as a feature request. Okay. So um, I'm just going to keep going then. If there are questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll check again at the end. So now that we've talked about logic statements and I've shown you a couple of real world examples, I would be reticent if I didn't mention the logic citation field that's sitting there underneath the before and the after logic sections. So this is um, a logic citation. We added these citation fields throughout the temp or the interview in 2019. And I think they're very important for the continued growth and support of your document automation projects. 
So I've been around long enough to see projects from a decade ago that are in dire need of an update, but all owners seem to be hesitant to do any updating because of the amount of work that they see is involved. Part of that tech debt that they're worried about isn't actually tech related. It's content and making sure that the legal requirements, that the reasoning, that the restrictions that were originally coded into the interviews are still good law. So to make it easier on yourself and the future developers who will work on your interview, add in notes and citations wherever you see these citation fields. There's a note section at the very top for the interview, if the interview question as a whole. There's um, citation fields for learn mores, for the question text itself. There's citations here. There's a note section in the, um, in the about for the whole interview. Anywhere you can add in information and explain why, like in the means test example, why is $25,000 and $35,000 legally relevant? Explain where you got that. It doesn't have to be a full citation like to a, a court document or to a case. You can just add in a short note explaining why you did something in these citation fields. And then it's very easy to run a citation report on the reports tab of your interview that will pull all of those notes and citation fields out into one space and let you check those underlying assumptions in a few minutes every couple of months rather than letting these interviews go five to ten years without anybody looking at them. It's, you know, just like you need to do spring cleaning in your house this time of year, it's a great time to do some spring cleaning of your interviews um, as well. And it makes it easier if you keep up with it rather than saving it for a couple of years. The All Logic tab is what is shown here. And it is a great tool to use when you want to see, as the name suggests, all the logic in one place. It lets you see all of the logic statements in your interview and edit them on the spot. It saves you time by not requiring you to dig around in individual questions when you want to make changes. So you can update any of the logic that currently exists in your interview. You can add logic to, to questions that currently have it. You can't add logic to pages that don't have the logic. Yeah, you have to do that on the question design editor. We've also tried to build in some help with logic statements for new authors. Um, you will get error messages when something isn't set up correctly. It might take some noodling to figure out what that error message means, but eventually you'll get the hang of it and we're also working to improve our error messaging. So if you're ever confused about an error message, you can check out FAQ number one on our website under the Learn tab if you hover over it. There is a Frequently Asked Questions section, and the very first one has error message um, debugging. And you can always email me with a screenshot, and I will try and work out what is wrong with your interview as well. Finally, some tips and tricks. Be careful with copying and pasting. Specifically, don't copy from Word. Word loves to put all kinds of hidden craziness and syntax behind a copy and paste. And when you drop it in, uh, A to J rejects it. And you keep copying and pasting into an advanced logic section. And it keeps disappearing and you keep getting more frustrated. Um, so if you do have to copy and paste, put it in a text editor first. Specifically, we recommend Notepad++. We are improving uh, copy and paste and sharing functionality in a new TIG that we're working on with our partners in Michigan, uh, but we don't expect that to be available and released until 2022. Um, if A to J tells you that you have an undefined variable, if that's, that's probably the most common error message, and you know that it's in your variables tab, you know that variable exists in your interview, Try clearing your browser's cache and reopening the guided interview, and the error message should be cleared. Sometimes if you're flipping between different interviews, A to J uh, caches the variables, and it, or your browser caches the variables, and A to J gets confused about the variable list. And again, I mentioned those common error messages. This is the direct URL to that FAQ number one, if you want to check it out. Now go practice. So uh, you... Most of the examples that I showed today are in this sample exercise called Scripting Advanced Logic Statements um, under the Learn tab again in A to J Author. If you hover over it and go to Sample Exercises, then scroll down to the one called Sample A to J Guided Interview Scripting Advanced Logic Statements. Click on it and it will walk you through with screenshots um, of everything your interview, your, what your final interview should look like, exactly the five conditions that you're going to be testing, and then step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. And if you have any questions after the sample exercise, feel free to uh, email me as well. 
And if there are any questions, feel free um, to put them in the chat now. I will check that. And also a reminder that the TIG cycle opened up today. Uh, Jane Ribadonera just sent out an email. It's not April Fool's. It's TIG season again. And the pre-applications, which I assume are what their letters of intent now are being called, are due May 14th. We are always happy to, happy to partner with you or to help you draft your application if you have a document assembly project or something you want to see added to A to J Author. This software is meant to help you in the authoring community. So if there's something you want added to it, talk to us. We'll figure out how to make that happen and uh, partner with you on a TIG if necessary. I'm also happy to help if you're just doing a project internally and you want to automate a couple of forms. I'm happy to help figure out how long that would take, how much money it might cost, um, what effort would have to go into that as well. So let me check on the chat and the questions. Oh, okay. So there was a question that when the question flow is controlled by an advanced condition, does it not matter which button the end user pushes on a page? Um, so if a button is setting a value to a variable, um, and so are you the plaintiff or the defendant, and it's setting, you know, um, party, party status to one or the other, the value that is stored on that button could be used in the advanced condition. Um, but otherwise, if it's to branch them regardless of any of the values potentially set by a button, then it doesn't matter which button they push. So um, the order of how things happen is the field questions are saved as values, um, and then the button values are potentially saved, and then both of those are evaluated by the um, conditions, and then branching happens based on the results of those conditions. So it doesn't, the software doesn't leave the, the user, the user doesn't leave the page until all of the uh, values have been set and then all of the conditions have been evaluated and then branching happens based on that. Are there any other questions? If any pop up during the month or you have any projects that you are trying, uh, that you need help on or you get stuck on, don't bang your head you know, against the wall for too long, feel free to reach out, jessica at cali.org. I'm happy to talk through any of your interviews. John, did you have anything else? Do you have any questions that you think at my exalted level I could help you with <laughs> as the executive director? Um, I'm kidding, of course. I, I, I know nothing. Jessica knows everything, um, and Tobias. Um, but but happy, to, happy to also talk about you. Let me also suggest, I mean, so last summer's um, um, ATJ intern project involved looking at every single state's automated forms, what we call the low-hanging fruit. Uh, Jessica, if you could drop the link to that, or, or I'll just point out that it's under um, about in, on the A to J author website. The point being is that's those the the forms that are not automated um, in your state are opportunity for for TIG grants. You can get money from LSC to automate those forms, and we'll help you out with that application. Um, the 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 hard thing in all of this is uh, is the subject matter expert. Somebody who knows about the reality of of automating an expungement or of dealing with an expungement pre without automation or uncontested divorce or domestic violence um, temporary restraining orders or any number of a dozen different relatively simple forms that should be darn well automated. I mean, we should do that. We should finish the job that we started a decade ago of of getting all the easy, simple, relatively speaking, stuff done. Um, for uh, SRLs. Thanks. So I'm showing um, our ATJ Fellows uh, spreadsheet that you can see. It's linkable to where um, she found interviews, where she didn't, where they were just fillable PDFs versus A to J interviews or automated and something else. Um, the link is in the chat if you are interested. Otherwise, notice, think, sorry. Notice the states along the top. So yep. find your state and look for all the non-green and say, I could do that. Yep. And alphabetical order too. That's oh, fine. good. We're good. Um, yeah. So thank you all for attending. Our next one will be first Thursday in May. And as always, feel free to reach out. So happy April. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.